Okay. Okay, good evening, uh, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome Miles Studemeyer to this uh, European Tester Networks um, seminar series. Uh, Miles is known for quite a few uh, things. So first, he had some great papers with Steve White. Um, then um, uh, about, about DMRG, especially on cylinders and many other works. Uh, but I think his, uh, his real claim to fame is, 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 is the connection of, of tensor networks with machine learning, with, uh, um, yeah, actually the, the figuring out all these, 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 these fascinating connections. And I'm sure he will um, get into somehow this motivation also today. But um, uh, he's also the author of, um, of one of the most, probably the most uh, used uh, open source package for tensor network simulations, um, iTensor. But um, let's hear what he has to say about the limits. Uh, what are the limits about the simulation of quantum computers? So Miles, the stage is yours. OK, thank you very much, Frank, and the other organizers for having me. Um, I've been enjoying these uh, seminars quite a lot. It's like one of the you know, better things to come out of this crazy, otherwise very crazy pandemic situation that we're all and I hope everybody is doing okay. Um, so that's right. So today I'll be talking about this question of what limits is the classical simulation of quantum computers, right? So this is a this is a topic that everybody urgently wants to understand. You know, what are what you know, in what sense are quantum computers really capable of doing better than classical computers? And um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that could make them hard to simulate. Naively, it's that they that they operate in an exponential space. But is that really what makes it hard? Um, after all, you know, you could store bits on a, on a classical computer and there could be exponentially many strings of bits, right? So what's, re what's really the thing about quantum computers that there's a dividing line between what's hard for classical simulation to do and what's easy? Um, so this is, this is now published work in PRX or at this archive link. Um, and also let me say this, this work is really, I hope would kind of kick off more serious future work. This is just kind of a first pass using the simplest tools from the Tensor Network Toolbox, just matrix product states and the, and the kind of humble TEBD algorithm. So, so perhaps a lot more could be done in this space within this framework. Um, I definitely wanted to highlight my collaborators on this work. Um, the, the first author is uh, Yiching Zhu, who is actually an undergrad um, in, in a kind of applied math department at Illinois when she joined with us on this project. And she was a CCQ intern at the time. And now she's doing a, a PhD in physics with Una Kim at Cornell. And then the real mastermind of this work, who I have to give like uh, 96.2 or whatever the amount you know, of, of credit is to, is uh, Xavier Weintal, who's, um, he really had this idea of using uh, tensor networks in the particular limit and the kind of particular mode that I'll talk about um, as maybe a more realistic way to compare classical simulations to um, non-error corrected quantum computers. So he's really responsible for like the kind of the, uh, the main insight I would say here. So now what's, what's the motivation of this work? It's a motivation that um, involves something that we've all seen and, and noticed and paid attention to is um, this recent effort by a team at Google to you know, use their state-of-the-art quantum computing hardware and state-of-the-art minds in their theory group to come up with a way to, um, you know, short of definite practical applications of quantum computers to say, can we just instead answer the question of can a quantum computer can demonstrably do something that's just hard for a classical computer to do, never mind whether it's useful or not. In fact, it's not useful. Let's just do something totally useless, but whose only virtue is that it's hard. And then by this, we'll, we'll at least you know, stake the claim or make the point that quantum computers can demonstrably do something that classical computers just cannot do in a, in a reasonable time. And now, of course, um, so this, this, this idea is called quantum supremacy. This is what you want to demonstrate. Of course, um, the definition of what's a reasonable time for the classical computer to run is fuzzy, but what we mean is that we don't want to wait, you know, multiple years for the, the, the uh, classical computer to finish. We want to do it on some time scale of, you know, months or weeks or something like that, ideally, do the same task that the quantum computer does. Um, now, what did the Google group actually set out to do? Um, without going into extreme detail, um, they have this, uh, sim this uh, quantum computer that's made of these um, superconducting qubits, which are these, these X-shaped things or these plus sign shaped things here in the schematic. And they um, ran a certain class of random quantum circuit on it. 
it's not totally random, but it it's just has elements of randomness and it scrambles the state. Um, and so that it ultimately, if you ran the perfect circuit would just take you off into the full Hilbert space. You're not into some kind of easily capturable subset of the Hilbert space, but really you know, take you off into some arbitrary direction in this exponentially large Hilbert space where quantum systems live. And basically they um, had alternating layers of single qubit gates that are chosen randomly from a fixed discrete set of gates. And then two qubit gates, which are applied in a fixed pattern onto a 2D geometry of uh, qubits. And these um, two qubit gates were of a fixed type. It was a certain kind of funny gate that's like a I swap pi over six, some particular gate. But they selected this gate um, for among other reasons, um, apart from experimental reasons, that it could be it could make things even harder to simulate classically. So they already had a lot of insight into possible loopholes that classical simulators could exploit, and they wanted to close as many loopholes as they could. Um, so this one key point is that this gate has full rank if you if you do a SVD of it along this cut. So that's it. That'll be important later for what I'm talking about. Um, and so again, not, not without getting way into the details, they um, did detailed benchmarks of their setup on smaller number of qubits where they could do things classically and understand in great detail their measure of fidelity that they're using, which is kind of an unusual proxy for fidelity, which is called cross entropy benchmarking. And I, and I might get into that a little bit later, but not, not in great detail. But the bottom line is they were able to um, plausibly extrapolate the um, classical resources needed to match, um, to, to you know, generate the state that the circuit ideally generates and then draw samples from it and do this over and over again many times out to the limit of um, working with 53 qubits and a, a, a circuit of comparable depth to the number of qubits. And um, then by um, separately doing um, classical simulations, which actually happen to involve tensor networks, but in a very different way um, than the way I'll be talking about, um, they, made an, they made this estimate that do, you know, performing this circuit on all 53 qubits and drawing samples from it um, would take 10,000 years to do. Um, with, a, with the best classical simulation that they could produce that involved quite sophisticated methods, including tensor networks. But then immediately, um, this claim was disputed. So very shortly after, a group associated with IBM put out a paper saying that, no, actually, this same task could be done in just two days. So that's a pretty big difference, right? 10,000 years, two days, which, which one is it? And their um, proposal involved using very large classical memory. So they're, they're calling secondary storage here. Um, and they didn't actually do it, but they just were, they laid out a scheme that, that, that showed that, you know, it should be possible to do this in two days. So, so but they didn't actually do it. So, but it still raises the question of like, how could these estimates be so different? What's the real number? Is it three days? Is it one year? Is it really 10,000 years? What's the true difficulty here? So that's, that's one question. Um, and, and interestingly, these classical estimates, when you look into the details, they hold a very high bar for the classical simulations, a very high bar. They say that um, the classical simulations can, can make, you know, can do all manner of shortcuts that they, that they want. Like if something is low rank, you can do an SVD and throw away singular values, which are exactly zero. You can use tensor networks to contract difficult, um, do difficult tensor contractions in some kind of smart way that, that drives down the cost. But in the end, all the classical simulations are um, having to produce the exact state defined by the circuit. So when they're saying it would take 10,000 years, they mean to really produce the state that the circuit makes and draw samples from it. Maybe not the whole state at once, but, but something that has perfect fidelity with that state. Um, really draw samples from that state. So that's, that's the bar that they're holding the classical simulations to. But then that, that raises a question of, is this really a fair comparison? Is this really you know, apples to apples here? Because are they holding their hardware to that same bar? And, and no, they can't, right? The hardware makes errors. So why can't the classical, classical simulation be allowed to make errors too? Okay, maybe it could, but then what, what does that buy you? you know, does, that, does that actually drive down the time for classical simulation? And the answer is yes, it does. If you make sort of smart errors that, uh, that compress your state. And that, that's really what matrix product states with TEBD does. So, um, so how well would you know, classical simulation perform if it was allowed to make errors at every step, just like real quantum devices do? So um, look, we're going to consider a approximate classical simulation strategy for simulating quantum circuits, which has the virtue of scaling linearly. Um, and this is a rigorous statement. I think you would all agree when you, when you see it's just TEBD with a fixed bond dimension, period. Um, 
it's going to scale linearly in the number of qubits and in the circuit depth, the trade-off will be that at every step we're going to lose fidelity. So basically, instead of um, working kind of for those in the know about tensor networks, instead of working at some fixed accuracy where we say we must keep the fidelity high to the target state at all times, we're just going to let the fidelity run down. We're just going to let it go down and down and down um, at every step, losing a bit more of the state. Um, but that's kind of how real quantum hardware works too. So it's a more, more fair comparison. It's like, if they can do that, why can't we do that? That's, that's the spirit. And the technique will be matrix product states. So let me um, briefly just give a background on matrix product states. But since this is an audience of a lot of experts, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So um, the setting here is that we're working with a mini qubit wave function. So think of you know, 53 qubits of dimension two Hilbert space each. And um, we can think of the uh, wave function as just being described by a set of amplitudes um, in, the, in this basis, you know, computational basis of the qubits. And then we can view this uh, set of amplitudes as a tensor with many indices, n indices, one for each qubit. And so if we just work with this full tensor, then this is a two to the n dimensional space of things. So we'd have to use two to the, two to the n uh, memory and time to work with this thing, to update it, to apply gates to it, to store it. So this would be you know, extremely inefficient. We couldn't really do it, right? But that was actually one of the strategies that was considered for estimating the time of the classical simulations was just to actually work in the full Hilbert space um, and try to use uh, you know, sparse matrix techniques to act on it um, with the Hamiltonian or with the gate, sorry. Um, so we won't do that. So we could try to do you know, some kind of compression where we say, well, maybe some of these amplitudes are rather small. So maybe we can throw out any amplitude that we see that's small, maybe we don't store those. And we try to do something with sparsity working in the computational basis. But that only gets you so far. And it turns out there's a much smarter thing you can do where you can use um, optimal low rank decompositions, uh, the, the main one being the singular value decomposition. Um, and you can exploit these by viewing the wave function as a matrix for some partition of the uh, qubits into row qubits and column qubits and sort of think of this as a big matrix do a compressed uh, truncated SVD, and then you could get some kind of computational advantage that way. Um, this is called a Schmidt decomposition. And then if you see um, singular values that are small below some threshold, you can throw those away and compress the state. And you can imagine doing that for all manner of different bipartitions of these indices into row and column. And if you think about doing that all at once simultaneously, that's one way to motivate the matrix product state decomposition of a tensor um, or of a wave function. So that's, that's like the framework of the compression of states that we're using here. And um, the main control parameter um, at play here is called the bond dimension. So that after we you know, do this Schmidt decomposition, we think about doing it on every partitioning. We have all these bonds that result, these kind of low rank constrictions, and we restrict them to be below a size chi. And um, this reduces our memory footprint from exponential to polynomial chi squared. And computations generally scale as chi cubed. But we could still represent any state if we took chi big enough to be exponential in the number of qubits. Now, the main um, way we're going to use this matrix product state is we're going to act single qubit gates and two qubit gates onto it. So one important point is that single qubit gates can be applied to update the matrix product state approximation of the state um, without any error whatsoever, without any approximation whatsoever. So we have our previous state as an NPS. We just act with the single qubit gate. We just do this contraction and we get an updated NPS tensor and we're done and no approximation needed and it's very efficient. Um, the, uh, the most important thing to notice is that we can only apply two qubit gates approximately while still staying in the same um, class of, of matrix product states with the same bond dimension in general. So we, we bring the two qubit gate, we act on two tensors. This temporarily locally destroys the NPS form because now these aren't separated anymore into two tensors. So we can restore it just by doing a, a matrix factorization like the SVD, and then to go back to the same class of NPS that we're working in. So for the rest of this talk, it's always that we're going to limit the bond dimension to at most a fixed value chi. Then we just keep the top chi singular values and we get an optimal approximation and then we update the state that way. So we, we stay with the same bond dimension, but we incur a small loss of fidelity at this step. Okay, that's the, that's the key tool we're doing. So it's very, very simple. But that's kind of the virtue. Um, the virtue of the simplicity here is something that we want to um, exploit to say that, like, um, even with these simple methods, how close can we get to, to you know, rivaling um, the best that quantum hardware could, could offer? That's sort of one of the questions. Also, it's simple. It has the virtue that we can um, really understand what happens at every step. We can really understand the error that we make, right? So we can take 
the state afterward, and we can just take the overlap of this state afterward made of these two tensors with the original one, um, the one with the gate applied, and we can easily compute what's the um, loss of fidelity incurred by only keeping the top chi singular values or throwing away the other singular values. So we can easily compute that locally at every step. Okay. Um, we can't, of course, you know, efficiently keep track of the ideal perfect state that would have um, resulted if we never threw away any singular values at any step. Although we can do that a little bit on small systems, but then we'll come up with a way to estimate that property later that's very reliable in this setting of uh, random quantum circuits. Okay, so now let's turn to the quantum circuits that we want to simulate. So motivated by these quantum supremacy experiments, um, first we're going to consider random circuits with a one-dimensional topology. So this is you know, different from what Google did, but it's more of a warm-up to try to understand things in a setting that's like native for MPS or where they should work really well. Um, so also a little differently from Google, we don't choose the single qubit gates from a fixed discrete set. We just choose them totally randomly, just like har random, um, you know, unitaries acting on a single qubit. And then we act with this kind of brick wall pattern of alternating two qubit gates in between every single qubit gate layer um, with some kind of fixed class of two qubit gate. And we try various ones, but mostly it's control C. Um, but we, we also could try I swap and these, these other ones that have a higher rank. So um, that's our setup, very simple. And then um, we have some depth D that we do these, these layers, each layer consisting of single qubit gates followed by two qubit gates. So layer one, layer two, layer three. And mostly we're interested in depths comparable to the number of qubits, though we'll consider some other depths too to try to understand how things scale. And then we just use the MPS techniques I outlined straightforwardly. Apply single qubit gates um, without approximation, then apply two qubit gates with, a, with this controlled approximation of truncating locally, and then two, um, single qubit gates, two qubit gates. And I'm kind of animating here the bond dimension growing, but eventually it, it maxes out at some chi that we set, and we don't accept the bond dimension to grow beyond that. Okay. So how well does this actually work um, quantitatively at a fixed bond dimension chi? So we do some studies to kind of get a handle on, um, on things where we can um, come up with some ways of estimating what's really happening with the true fidelity on larger systems. And also just to see how effective this, uh, this bond dimension, you know, fixed bond dimension is for uh, holding onto the fidelity. So um, here the data is just in 1D for 20 qubits for the circuits, the kind of circuits that I showed. So basically what happens is there's two regimes. So one is that the fidelity of the exact state stays very close to unity for about 10 to 20 layers. Then it just goes off the cliff. It just decreases exponentially. But the important thing is that, so you know, if we did this um, for, say, simulating time evolution numerically, we wouldn't be happy with this. We would say, this has failed. You know, we didn't take the bond dimension large enough, or you shouldn't trust these results, this kind of thing. But instead, working at fixed bond dimension, um, this thing is behaving just like real quantum device, a real quantum device does. I'm not saying that you know, the errors are the exact same errors, but just the idea that um, real quantum devices that are not error corrected also incur a small loss of fidelity at every step, every time you do a two qubit gate. So that's, that's the same between this method and those, those um, experiments. So basically we're just running TEBD off a cliff. That's the setting here, okay. So I was just kind of picturing the Roadrunner, you know, leading Wiley Coyote off a cliff and there he goes down. Um, so now how can we um, get a handle on the behavior of the fidelity because we're going to be able, we're going to need to know what the fidelity is doing beyond 20 qubits, like to much larger qubits. Um, so how can we get an estimate of what it is without also having the exact state to compare to? So it turns out because of this setting that we're dealing with random quantum circuits, um, what we can do is we can get the fidelity to a very good, the true fidelity, right, to the exact state, to a very good approximation by just taking these fidelities that happen every time we apply a two qubit gate and get the fidelity between the last approximate state and the next approximate state, and just multiplying them together, right? We can just do that. So we can think like, well, maybe these errors are totally uncorrelated with each other, so that the error goes down is just the product of all the errors that we incur. You know, whatever percent of the state we keep, we just multiply over and over again, and that tells us the overall percent of the state that we've kept. And um, so we try this out, and it works extremely well. So the um, the crosses are the exact fidelity where we do an exponentially costly simulation of the random circuit and keep that on the side and then do our MPS simulation at some fixed bond dimension and just overlap these two together and get the exact fidelity. So that's what the crosses or the dots or the 
plus signs are showing these points. And then the solid lines are showing this formula, where we just take every two qubit gate fidelity and just keep multiplying them together and plot the result. And it's basically perfect agreement. Um, and we can see um, so that it works. And we can also see that um, things fall into a straight line eventually, which means that um, this two qubit um, gate fidelity is saturating to some fixed value, some kind of characteristic long time value. So that's what we can see from these plots. And this is great because now we have a tool where we can go to more qubits where we cannot anymore afford to do an exponential side calculation. But we can just always multiply these numbers together because we get these numbers for free with the MPS methods and have a good handle on what's the true fidelity. So this is a really good tool to have. So at a polynomial cost, right, we can we can know what the true fidelity is, even though we don't have the exact state around. Um, so we find this, you know, for all depths, um, not just asymptotically. We can really just do this straight from the beginning, um, from the first step to the last step, and get a good match. Okay, I already said this basically. So we can do, you know, only work polynomially hard to estimate something that, in principle, is exponentially hard to get. And you know, why does this work? Um, you know, basically, it has to do with the uh, the fact that we're comparing the, the, the true state we're comparing to is random. So it's always sort of has the signs of its amplitudes are always flipping around and things are getting scrambled. So the, um, there's sort of no memory in a sense that that random state has um, of the other states that we threw away when we did the truncation of the MPS. It's a little bit hard to put into words, but there's a more of like a, a rig slightly rigorous argument in the paper, or more of like a quasi rigorous kind of physicist argument in the paper about why this is a good approximation. OK, so then the next question becomes, how far can we push things, right? So we can see that we get better and better um, two, ga two qubit gate fidelities with increasing chi. I think I'm missing a chi here. Um, so as we pump chi up from 10 to 20 to 50, which is still very easy classical simulations, we can see that this straight line behavior gets flatter and flatter and flatter. So we lose less of the state or we make less error to the true state at every step. So things are getting better. So how flat can we get it? You know, how well can we do? Does increasing chi improve the situation arbitrarily, right? Do we keep you know, paying only an, a polynomial cost to just do better and better and better and better? And we know that for, um, for exponentially large chi, the gate fidelities, the two qubit fidelities have to go to one. So we know that it, in some sense, it's always gonna improve as we um, increase chi, but what's the, what's the behavior, right? Is it always worth doing? Or is there kind of diminishing returns? What, what really happens, right? Um, so the answer basically is that ultimately we'll see is diminishing returns. Um, but let's kind of step, it, step through it a bit. So now let's go to the case of 60 qubits. And then we'll consider some circuits where the depth is less than the number of qubits and some where it's, it's greater than the number of qubits or comparable to the number of qubits. Okay. So first of all, for the case where the depth is less than the number of qubits, we really can just keep getting better and better and better um, gate fidelities, two qubit fidelities by increasing chi. So here's chi increasing um, very, you know, and then we see that um, we're getting very, you know, rapid decrease of the error made at every step. But then as the depth goes larger than the number of qubits, we see a different behavior. We see that the average gate fidelity really seems to saturate or almost saturate. Basically, the, we get diminishing returns. We keep making chi bigger, you know, here we're like doubling chi, doubling chi, doubling. And it seems that things are almost plateauing, that we're not really getting much better error at every, this is just the error at every step of our simulation, we, we, which we can always get by just overlapping the um, next MPS with the previous MPS. We're not getting much of a gain, right? So diminishing returns. So to really kind of um, understand this, we did a calculation where we said, you know, we thought about it and actually the edges are always um, exact for those of you who know MPS methods in detail. So we should exclude those. Also that the MPS methods work better at earlier steps at earlier layers. So we should exclude those. So when you really only look in the bulk away from the edges and only at later layers, the D infinity just means once this behavior is settled down, like once you're in this regime, that's what D infinity refers to. Just this regime where you've really started going off a cliff. Um, things do become very flat. So you find that there really seems to be some kind of um, asymptotic best uh, fidelity that you can reach, no matter how big you pump chi, although at exponentially big chi, we know this eventually has to go to zero, but it seems that um, it's, it becomes you know, painfully slow to get there, basically. Okay, so summary, you know, summarizing this part, 
increasing chi rapidly increases the two um, qubit gate fidelity up to actually about 99%, which um, already is very interesting. So this is equivalent to very high quality qubits, right? So already, if you're comparing this to um, someone working with real quantum hardware, simulating one dimensional random quantum circuits, this is already setting a pretty high bar. It's saying we can, on the classical computer, make qubits that have like a 99% two, um, two gate fidelity just with these very simple classical tools. Um, but you know, you think, well, let's let's try to beat these experiments. Let's let's do better. You find out that you really can't. That increasing chi much more than this just doesn't buy you anything. But of course, for exponentially big chi, you have to you know finally get the fidelity to one. Okay. So um, so one technical point is that how can we resolve these last two points? Right. I already alluded to this. That how can it be that it plateaus, but then somehow still the error goes to zero, the fidelity goes to one. Basically, our picture of what's happening is that in the bulk, you really are saturating. But then as you keep um, doubling chi and doubling and chi and doubling chi, you're doing things more and more exactly at the edges. So you, you first you get you know the first three bonds at the edge, right? Then you double chi, and now you get the first four, right? And then you get the next one, the next one, the next one. But it, you have to keep doubling chi, making these exponentially big increases in chi. And you only get one more bond of the MPS to be exact. So, um, so effectively, you really do have a plateau until you really push things exponentially. Okay, so then the big picture here in 1D, you know, summarizing all this is that we have an algorithm that always um, incurs only a linear cost in the number of qubits and in the circuit depth that has a two qubit gate fidelity um, that's around 99%. Um, so any 1D quantum computer that has less than this gate fidelity, um, we can beat it classically assuming that these random circuits are the hardest task you can have. Maybe there's some harder task than this, but if this is the hardest task, then we can basically beat um, quantum computers operating on these 1D quantum circuits that have a worse fidelity than this. So this is really kind of getting to the answer of the question of the talk. You know, what limits the simulation of, of, quantum, compu of a quantum computer by classical means? It's really um, not that quantum computers do things that are exponentially hard on their face. It's that they um, you know, maintain a high fidelity, right? Because we have an algorithm that's, that's linear in number of qubits and in depth, just like the experiments are. So then the real race is who has a better fidelity. That's where the real race is between um, this kind, this flavor of classical simulation and the experiments, not just who can do the most qubits, like who can address the most qubits or run the deepest circuit, right? So Maybe that was a point that was already obvious uh, to a lot of you, but we wanted to make this quantitative and really offer like a practical way to look at it through well-known MPS algorithms. Okay, so now let's um, just kind of for two slides or three slides, get into a technical matter, which is how can there be this plateau in fidelity, right? So why is it that increasing the bond dimension helps you a lot at first, but then after a while, you get diminishing returns. What could be responsible for this? And it basically has to do with the setting that these are um, layers of, of, of quantum circuit that randomize the state. So the brief explanation of the arguments, this was obvious argument in the paper that I thought was really interesting, is let's assume that what the circuit does, and this is you know, not really what it does, but let's, let's, let's make the leap that you know, even one layer of the circuit just maximally randomizes the entries of all the MPS tensors um, before the two qubit gate acts. So we have the layer of one qubit gates. So let's just say they each act on their MPS tensor and just totally scramble it, which isn't true, but let's just say that it's true. Um, then the idea is that the singular values after we act with the two qubit gate and then split back into two MPS tensors will have some kind of universal scaling form. So that the fidelity after the truncation will become independent of chi. So it'll sort of saturate to some form where the shape of it is going to like lose its dependence on chi. Um, so what that means is that keeping a larger chi um, isn't really keeping more of this um, distribution of singular values. It's just taking the continuum limit and you're always just keeping half of this continuum thing. You're keeping the first um, chi values out of the two chi. But increasing chi is just, just taking the continuum limit. Um, so, um, Basically, this, this is some kind of fundamental limit of this TEBD approach to simulating these uh, random quantum circuits. But in practice, we always do a little better than this because um, the one, the single qubit layer can't really fully randomize the state. So this is just some kind of picture of what's going on. 
Okay, so let me let me unpack that a little bit more in some details. So the um, the sketch of the argument here is that let's just make the assumption that when we take the previous state, we act with the single qubit um, gates, then it's the same as if we had put MPS tensors that were just drawn randomly. And here we're, we, we make a distribution that's kind of motivated by random matrix theory, um, but it's not maybe so terribly important. And so we draw these MPS tensors randomly, then we act with our fixed class of two qubit gate, get the merge tensor, do the SVD, where we're always, um, here in this case, I'm considering a, uh, well, no, that's right. We always go to two chi singular values in the untruncated form, and then we want to truncate back to chi singular values afterward. So that's that's the setting, right? So we always double the number of singular values and then keep the first half of them. And um, when you do this for larger and larger chi for some you know fixed class of two qubit gate, you observe you you can observe a collapse actually of the curve of these eigenvalues, um, the squares of the singular values. So they seem to collapse into a universal form. And there's two different curves here basically having to do with whether the two qubit gate has rank two when you cut it here or rank four when you cut it here. So we observe this collapse. And all this is just motivated by um, kind of standard random matrix theory sort of thinking. But here it's applied in a tensor context instead. So Xavier called this the uh, Gaussian tensor ensemble. And we could debate about whether this is a good name because it's not quite the same. You know, we don't, we don't consider these tensors to come from say, a certain class of tensors, like the way you would with Hermitian matrices or something like that. But basically, it's just an argument um, that is borne out by these numerical checks really well. So what's the payoff of observing this collapse of eigenvalues in the large chi limit, where you always initiate with these random tensors? The payoff is that if you just write the formula for what's the fidelity in the limit of large chi, it's the sum of the squares of the um, singular values up to chi, the ones you keep, divided by all the singular values added up. So this is just the exact formula for the fidelity. If you go back through computing the overlap of this with this, and um, you just find that's, that's the expression. And if you assume this scaling form and take the contingent limit by taking chi larger and larger and larger, it just becomes the ratio of these two integrals, which no longer depend on chi. You can take chi out of it just by changing variables. So then there's this universal number that only depends on these assumptions and whether the two qubit gate has rank two or rank four. Um, and that number is 96.2% for the case of rank two, two qubit gates, and 93.2% is rank four. So if all these assumptions hold up, then it can explain why um, after you get through these initial layers where you can sort of keep the state really well, why you plateau in the two qubit uh, fidelity until you reach this very extreme regime where you start treating the edges more and more and more exactly because you're on a finite size system, which is really a totally separate regime way off to the side. So you have this kind of intermediate behavior. OK, any questions about that, that part? This would be a good time to ask. Uh, I, I have a question. So sure. I seem to remember for some results that in this like simulation of random circuits, uh, there are some hardness results that there's a threshold that once the error, the noise becomes strong enough, it becomes easy to simulate and there's a phase transition to something that's hard to simulate. Can I think of this plateau as kind of measuring that, that if the fidelity I want to achieve is below this plateau, then it's easy to simulate. And as I increase the fidelity I want, there's some phase transition to something that's hard to simulate. Yeah, that's how we're thinking about it. And so remember, this is all in a specific setting of, you know, 1D, random quantum circuits of this type with certain class of fixed to be qubit gates. So if you relax some of these uh, assumptions or change them, you might have to reevaluate some of these, these arguments. But at least within this setting, and again, these aren't totally rigorous statements, they're more like observations. But that's what it seems to be saying to us, that, that yes, there really is some um, fidelity that if, say, the quantum, the quantum device can get beyond this fidelity, then it's like this kind of hard limit where at least these MPS approaches within this framework just can't go. Yeah. So it's like a really dividing line between hard and easy. Mm. Yeah, I think there are some proofs that that, that, that does happen if you have a noisy circuit. It would be interesting to compare to right. see if they gave the same. Yeah, and that, that's, that makes sense because it's all consistent. Um, but then I think it raises some interesting questions, which they're a bit beyond what we've thought about. But I'll say it again at the end of like, um, can we get some of these statements to match up? Like, can we view these, these classical schemes as kind of coming from below and maybe like lower bounding um, some of this, some of these numbers? So, you know, maybe we could push this up by um, 
by delaying how much we truncate, you know, act, um, just keep this tensor exact and maybe add another, you know, another qubit afterward and then come back and then truncate it, you know, after we've applied a whole bunch of gates or something and get a different class of classical simulation that maybe pushes these um, fidelities even higher. And, and is there some limit to that game fundamentally that we can, that we, you know, that we can play? these kind of questions. And, and how does that interplay with the idea of thresholds and error correcting schemes for quantum computers? That's like a big question, which I don't feel totally qualified to answer, but I, I just wanted to put it out there for those of you who are very well versed in those, those topics to think about if there's a connection to these concrete classes of classical simulation. Um, can I ask a short, another question? Mm -hmm. Just to understand things, so the G function here is kind of empirical, right? G function. Yes, it's just the uh, all, all the argument relies on is that um, all the argument for the existence of this f infinity is just that, that some G function exists that this collapses to. Yeah. Okay. And then but you can just kind of estimate it numerically and do like a numerical integral to get these values. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, in principle, maybe there's actually some like closed form expression for this G function, but okay. I mean, I yeah, don't I, I don't know. That that gets into um, random matrix theory sort of topics that I'm just not an expert on. But I, I'm sure there's people here who who know a lot about those things. So maybe one of them could comment. But um, but I'm not sure if there's a closed form. OK, yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, one more question. Sure. Uh, so it seems to me that the, that the plateauing is related, presumably, to uh, volume scaling of the entanglement entropy. Um, let's see, uh, quite possibly so. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I guess I don't have a major comment to make to that, that statement, but definitely there's a regime where early on we can just keep um, all the state and not go over our chi budget. So the earlier states simply fit into the class of MPS of bond dimension chi or less. So there things are perfect then they sort of smoothly cross over to less perfect into this regime of we don't gain anything by, by taking time bigger. So, so probably that's really what's happening is we're sort of making our way through states that have area law and wading out deeper and deeper into the you know, Hilbert space C and getting out into volume law states. That's probably right. It sounds right to me. Okay, so now lastly, um, I'll just talk about early efforts that were in this paper, which some of which are continuing to say, okay, um, so much for 1D, this sets a very high bar for experiments of, on 1D circuits, but that's not really where the action is. People doing these um, experiments, trying to make useful quantum devices already know that having two, two dimensional connectivity of the qubits um, has a lot of power to it. Like let's say if you're actually trying to make like a surface code later on or something like that. There, that's, that's really where people are working is with these 2D connected quantum circuits. So what can we do there? And these are just kind of early attempts, but it may be, uh, points the way a little bit to, as a community, can we, you know, bring all our heads together and keep pushing these, you know, kind of keep pushing on this with better and better and better techniques from the tensor network community. Um, so the actual experiments by Google were carried out for 53 qubits with a 2D connectivity pattern, right? So they could apply gates this way or, or that way, right? So it's, it's a much different circuit than this 1D class of circuit that we were just testing earlier, just to lay out some of these ideas about how do we think about hardness of of a quantum computer, um, a non-error corrected one. Um, so can we still use matrix product state simulation techniques, these, these rather simple ones, to reach kind of you know, comparable fidelities experiment? Maybe not beat them, but can we, can we kind of get into the same regime? How far can we push? So on a, on a purely technical level, the 2D connectivity is not a problem. We know how to do this. So we can just do these standard tricks that we use for 2D for time evolution to um, to act gates that act non-locally in 1D, which um, you know, one version of this is that you, after you do all the single qubit gates, you apply a set of swap operators to bring this qubit over to where it's the neighbor of that one. Then you apply the gate on them as neighbors using the same method we did for 1D, then you just swap back, or you just wait to swap until you see what the next two qubit gates gonna be, and then do the minimal number of swaps to get ready to apply that one. So we have, we have ways of doing this. So technically, it's not a problem. However, if you just do that, the fidelities you get are very bad. Um, things are not good at all. So then um, you know, we were thinking, okay, how can we remedy this? What can we do to sort of breathe a little more life into this MPS technique in this 2D case? And, and the key thing is that we want to make 
as few truncations as we can, that's where we lose the fidelity. So can we somehow apply some of the gates, even the two qubit gates, with no loss of fidelity and only have to incur losses of fidelity every so often with the more longer ranged ones, you know, some of the more bad ones. Um, so what we do is just group qubits together. And this is an um, exponential trade-off, right? The cost is gonna grow exponentially with the number of qubits that we group. So we have some gonna cross over here where we're, for any finite amount of grouping, things are polynomial, but if we push up the grouping, we're paying exponential price. But the payoff is we can now carry out certain of the two qubit gates exactly, right? Any two qubit gates that act within the group, we just apply and go on and no loss of fidelity at all at those steps. So maybe we kind of delay the losses of fidelity or kind of sparsify them out through the circuit and we only say lose fidelity on this one and that one and not at all on this one and this one, something like that. So that's how we can kind of extend the life a little bit of these um, simple NPS techniques, right? So these ones that act within the grouping, no loss of fidelity. But then at some point, we're going to have to change the grouping um, in order to act across these cuts, across these um, NPS kind of bonds, if you want to call them that. And so at these steps, we're going to do a split and SVD with some truncation to control the size of these bonds and then merge back to change the grouping. So we're going to be, be shifting basically from kind of grouping A to grouping B back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then every time we're in a certain grouping, um, apply all the gates that are exact within that grouping. That's how it's going to work. And again, there could be better schemes, but this is just one that, that pushes you a little further in 2D. But otherwise, you know, carrying out the same techniques as for 1D, when you're working within the grouping, um, you get some interesting results. So these different colors and symbols are um, showing different grouping strategies. For example, this one where you have um, four columns grouped together. So you think of this 2D array and you do four columns of qubits all grouped, two columns, two columns, and four. So these different groupings. Um, and, and then there's like this five, two, five, six, six. So these, these different groupings that you can um, basically put down and then you're kind of shifting that pattern back and forth in 2D um, and trying it out. And they have various trade-offs, like some start right away with better fidelities, but are more expensive. So you kind of run out of gas sooner in terms of what you can afford. Other ones have worse fidelities, but you can push the bond dimension of the leftover bonds that are still treated with MPS techniques higher for the sort of similar classical cost. So you can try these different trade-offs that are not so obvious. And what's interesting is that there's one particular grouping, it's this 4224 pattern that you shift back and forth and apply all the gates that fit within the blocks, um, where you can actually get the um, same gate fidelity or better than um, what Google got or you know, claimed to get in their experiments by just taking the bond dimension a bit over 300. Um, so that's, that's kind of amazing, right? That you can use 1D techniques just with this trick of grouping two different ways and get similar fidelities to them. But there's a catch that I'm, I'm leading to. But by the way, I should say, um, they didn't even report fidelities. They reported this quantity called the XEB, cross entropy benchmarking. And um, it's not so clear from that what the fidelity is, but we found an empirical relationship between the two that can let us estimate one from the other. Nevertheless, we actually chose to make things harder for ourselves. So Google had re reported a XEB of 98.6. Um, and we just said, let's challenge ourselves to get a fidelity of 98.6, which is actually harder. So we did something harder than what they're reporting, but for the wrong kind of two qubit gate. So that's where we still haven't matched them. They didn't use control Z two qubit gate. So these, these, this data I'm showing is all for control Z. Um, the catch is that control Z are rank two. So when you apply control Z gates onto the MPS, um, say, think about you know, applying them across one of these bonds, it only will um, you know, increase the entanglement so much. If you, do the, if you do two qubit gates of the same family as Google's, these I spot pi six gates, those are full rank. So that makes the entanglement grow much faster and it makes things a lot harder for the MPS. So then we could push again with these kind of grouping strategies of different ones and see that things are still trending toward you know, we're on our way um, toward finally maybe getting to um, meet their value for now the same class of circuit, but we ran out of gas for the um, level of you know, performance of the codes that we were doing. We weren't, we weren't doing parallelism. We weren't using other computational tricks, no GPUs. So without all those tools at our disposal, we can only push it this far and, and come up short of what Google did. And that's fine, because actually I kind of wanted that to happen because I think it's really amazing what Google did. And I'm kind of cheering for them too. But so to me, the payoff of all this is just understanding what's really hard, what's really easy, how impressive is it that what they did. 
Okay, so that's the summary of the effort so far in 2D. Um, so let me just summarize the talk first. So basically matrix product state compression enables approximate classical simulations, not these ones that are tasked with keeping the whole state, but just approximate simulations, but which in every other way mimic real quantum devices. They lose fidelity at every step. They have a scaling that's linear in N and D if you work at a, a fixed chi, um, in N being the number of qubits, D being the depth. And then we find for 1D random circuits, we can simulate classically um, up to 99% two gate fidelity with a polynomial cost for basically any depth or qubit number. So basically these, these classical simulations act like really good quantum computers. Um, like if you put them in a black box and didn't tell me, is there actual hardware in there or an MPS, you know, it'd be hard to tell until the, the experimentalists can get their fidelity above 99%. Um, but for 2D, of course, things are much harder for these 1D methods. We can get surprisingly good fidelities, especially for certain classes of 2D bit gates, but it's still lagging well behind the best hardware at the moment with these strategies. So, you know, what limits the classical simulation of quantum computers? I said it earlier, but basically it's not the number of qubits per se or the depth per se, but it's really the two qubit gate fidelity of the devices and it's the dimensionality or connectivity of the circuit that they're running. It's the interplay of those two things from the point of view of these MPS simulations kind of as an adversary. Um, but you know, that's, that's kind of good news for the experimentalists in some way. It says, focus your efforts on getting fidelity higher and focus on being able to address qubits in a more con you know, complicated connectivity. And that's something people are definitely working on. Um, so now in terms of just quickly putting out some future directions, here we address random quantum circuits. How well can we do with kind of similar strategies for structured quantum circuits that actually perform a task? Like, you know, the circuit that does Shor's algorithm or Grover's algorithm. And there's been some past work in this direction, but I don't know if it's fully considered the setting of just allowing the um, fidelity to kind of go down as you run, but kind of hoping that you can still win the race so that you don't lose too much fidelity for the result to still be useful. So I don't know if there's been work published so far that's, that's made that kind of trade off or played that exact game. And there's other structured circuits now people are studying. It'd be interesting to run those through this perspective. Um, and of course, one question would be, um, could we take methods like, um, like say Frank Pullman and Mike Zalatel's Moses move in isometric 2D tensor networks and use that to do TEBD and try these random quantum circuits and with PEPs, 2D tensor networks, and how well could one do? That would be very interesting. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier too, what's the interplay between things like thresholds of um, error correcting schemes for quantum computing? And um, is there an interesting interplay between these lossy or approximate classical simulations and this error correction? You know, what, what are these thresholds for these different um, codes and error correction schemes say about what we can expect classical simulations to be able to do as we say push with better methods than just this humble TEBD and PS setup. Um, you know, it sort of has to be that these um, meet each other. Otherwise, we could just use tensor networks to solve exponentially hard problems. So something has to give. What is it? Is it tied to that um, limiting fidelity that we saw earlier? Um, and that's, that's all I have to say. So thanks, and I'll take your questions. Thanks a lot, Les, for this very uh, interesting talk. Any questions? Maybe I have one. Uh, because now everything was done on mixed states, but on a quantum computer, it probably also has some coupling to environment. Could one also include this and this? I mean, when, when simulating mixed state on MPS, for example, it, it's also getting easier, right? Mm -hmm. in That's certain right. cases. Yeah, I think you could. Um, let me see. Um, it's a great idea. So basically to just realize that, um, to like allow ourselves to pass into the set of mixed states. Yeah. Right, to have some dissipation. I mean, like similar to this uh, Dowie method as we did with Tibor. Um, That's right. Um, I guess the only thing I would wonder is, you know, um, if one is interested in sampling um, from it, would since that's kind of a mini qubit observation, would that be too affected by say, something like what you did where you throw out long string operators, but, but maybe not because maybe again, you just say, well, we just wanna keep some overall fidelity and maybe the weight with those operators doesn't contribute as much to the fidelity of the target. Right. State. But maybe then it depends on what kind of measurements we do in the end. I mean, this is just. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but it's interesting because I mean, one could wonder if, if yeah, that that class of, of the operators that you suppress contributes less to the fidelity. So maybe there is some payoff like that for working with mixed space. So I had a, a few comments. So one, like you, you were making the connection with the fault tolerance and. Yeah, so it, if you have two plus one dimensions, then you do have a, a threshold, and it's roughly around one percent for like, to to gate fidelity. So you're 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 getting there. Um, the other thing is, so what you're doing is you're essentially simulating the actual quantum state to within a certain fidelity, and then you can sample for, from that as many times as you want, right? You can yes. sample from each level, which is in fact something with. Uh, even harder than what the quantum computer is doing, which is like every time you want to sample, you have to rerun the experiment in the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a, there's a paper by Martin van der Nest, which like makes this comparison of strong simulation and weak simulation and you know, make, makes this point. And um, maybe, maybe you can sort of combine what you're doing with um, you know, the, these kind of ideas of, of sampling and it's, it's actually a, a somewhat easier problem. And the third is like a, another approach that is some people in Alibaba, I think they were trying to do this like high end quantum simulations. And one thing they consider is like a noise model where they just depolarize with some probability certain certain bonds and then or, or certain certain qubits. And that's sort of like cutting a bond in, in your tensor network contraction. Um, Those are great comments. I, I should point out that um, that there's this paper that I'm really fascinated with. Um, at the, the person leading that was as Pan Zhang, I think, um, who has this general contraction scheme for. Um, there's a sort of parallel paper too by Adam German proposing like an earlier version, but it's like a general contraction scheme for arbitrary tensor networks. So just imagine like a arbitrary graph with tensors on it. You just want to contract it like a graphical model in machine learning or something. Um, so they use this. Um, and it's basically built on matrix product states. You just turn pieces of the network into an MPS locally and use MPS moves to decimate the, circ the whole network. Um, they use that to do a similar kind of thing as to what you said, Fernando, where they, they said, let's not go for the whole state, but let's just go for one sample at a time and kind of repeatedly contract the circuit in some optimal way using little pieces of MPS kind of decimating the circuit in whatever pattern. Um, and each time we get one sample. So I think they found that they could, uh, um, I don't remember quite the quality that they got, but it was pretty impressive too. Yeah. So related to that, Miles, so what is the complexity of, of uh, determining the probability of having a particular outcome? Hmm. Oh yeah, so that's not um, hard. So I mean, if we, it's a good question, but if I understand it correctly, um, if you're asking, you know, at the end, we have the state that we have, which is some distance away from the target state, but is still keeping, you know, a lot of it. Um, then we can ask, okay, give me some bit string of, you know, some configuration of the qubits. What's the probability of that? That can just be evaluated with a cost of um, chi squared in chi squared complexity. Um, you just you know you just fix the uh, indices. No, no, sure, but but you could probably okay. if, if I know you know that the goal you could do it much more yeah. efficiently to start with, no? Because it would kind of okay. just evolve half of the circuits from the initial state. You evolve actually the endpoint also half of it, and you take the oh, okay. so yes. Oh, so you're saying you set yourself that goal before you do anything? Yes. Recently. And the yes. question is, how hard is this? Is there like a complexity result that this is like the Google people? Do they say this is still hard or? or because oh. that's obviously a, a simpler task, no? For 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 an MPS yeah. calculation, it's, it's basically you gain a square root in some sense. Yeah. That now that you mention, I think that's what the Panjang paper does. They they say, okay, we put that on one end, so now it's just the task of contracting a network. It's like a single number, and we just have to contract it any way we can. And then they have like a greedy algorithm to do this. So, so I don't know, but their algorithm seems like one of the best practical attempts to do this so far that I know. Because it does it in this greedy, adaptive way. Okay. So and could you then, like could you then use maybe some Monte Carlo moves to try to find the most likely outcome? Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah, right. So you mean also kind of try to then repropose another bit string, say? To exactly, say exactly. And then, yeah. and then basically do something like, okay, if this is easier to calculate, then, then uh, yeah, this is a possibility. It's a probability. That's really interesting. Easier. And then kind of explore that. Yes. Using using the contraction as a subroutine or something. Yes, yeah. exactly. 
is, right. is that the, the kind of things that, that well, this should be possible, but yeah. I don't know whether it's whether. I, th I think basically all the machinery is there. So I think it's just a matter of hooking those two ideas together, you know. So this, this I keep mentioning this Panjang algorithm, but it's something you could code in, in just a couple of days for if people who know MPS. And they even have a code already in Python that you could just use. And so then that could just be connected exactly with this kind of search that you're proposing. So that'd be very interesting. So basically, I think the takeaway is there's, there's really so much that could still be tried and done in this space. And this is just like the humble first entry and, and really the only idea here is to do something we don't do as often, which is to run MPS off a cliff rather than to use it to try to hold on to the fidelity. We just let it run down. But again, that's what the devices do too, without error correction. Um, may I ask a question? Hmm? Yeah, so I'm not sure whether this is already answered by previous question brought up by other comments or speak um, people, but um, can you comment on if one use kind of Monte Carlo tensor network method like kind of proposed by Andrew Ferris and also I think you also did one work on it. Like if you do a truncation using kind of Monte Carlo sampling to get to a lower bound dimension, then somehow you can still reach a certain time point and you can sample um, you can sample the bit string in the end. And can you kind of probably push it to a further time by doing that? I think so. Let me let me see if it would be if it would really be appropriate for that. I guess the question is, in my mind, the question of whether that would work right is um, is let's say the goal is to get a number out where you say I set myself the task of here's a completely closed tensor network with no open indices and I just want to estimate this number. Then you know Andy Ferris's scheme can give you that. Um, so if you want to say ask what's the probability of getting a certain bit string to draw it at the end, you, I think you could definitely use his approach to get, get that. I don't know as much of whether you could then turn that around to then do the sampling of the bit string. I mean, you might have, you might have to yourself propose it. Um, but then if you kind of combine that with some idea like what uh, Frank said a minute ago, you could probably still use this information to kind of walk the space of bit strings. Um, you know, propose a new one, see if it actually has higher probability, reject or accept and that kind of thing. So I think you could hook this all together. That's a very interesting idea, unless I'm missing something where it wouldn't work, yeah. Oh, but you know, I should, I should say though that, oh, here's the kicker though, right? So Andy's method is not, uh, is not free from the sign problem. So, so you have to consider that. Um, but it's been a while since I've thought about it in detail, so I have to go look, but we should go look. So maybe I have another question. So uh, since you posted that paper, people got very excited and they were thinking, okay, by next year, Miles will have simulated the Google quantum computer. Why have you not done that? Yeah, so, um, so I can't report, you know, some of this is work in progress. So I can't tell everything, but basically one thing that we can tell right away, we just share is that you know, you would think that this curve is just, you, these, line, these look like straight lines. So like, this is just gonna go down. So all we have to do is keep pushing. So it's merely a question of just getting the code to perform better. Meaning like, you know, put it on GPU, you know, parallelize, like that's all you have to do, you might think. Um, but unfortunately it does start to curve. So it doesn't, it doesn't just shoot down. Um, so you find that it's not, as, not just a matter of we have to get to this bond dimension. It's more of a matter of we actually need a different scheme that really holds on to more of the state that doesn't start making truncations as early or, or you know, we, we group more or, or, we, or we do things like what you're alluding to where we maybe try to come from two different sides at once and so on. So we have to really come up with better algorithms too. Uh, one question. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to me there's, there's a qualitative difference if one is doing a quantum simulation in the sense that it does not care about block entanglement entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, while on the tensor network side, you always need to truncate it at the end of the day. And so that while the, while the quantum simulation itself also has an error, it seems qualitatively different mm -hmm. uh, in a sense that it does not have to truncate bond dimension space because it doesn't care about it. So the, it's a different type of approximation. So the question is to what extent uh, this can be put on a similar footing 
Right, I like this question. I mean, so, you know, I, I think that in the context of just what Google is setting up to do and the, how they framed things where you say, um, which is, it's a really interesting idea, right? Because it's going straight for supremacy. Um, it says, we just have to get close enough to some arbitrary state that's random, you know? So then as long as um, we're allowed to be in some ball, you know, of some distance epsilon from that state, you know, the one kind of hardware ends up on this side of the ball, our method ends up on another side, another kind of hardware. Our goal is just get within this ball, but we might end up in different places in that ball, you know? Um, but it's, it's just an arbitrary distance to some arbitrary state. So who's to say whether being on this side of that ball or that side is really better or worse? That's, that's sort of one half of the answer, I would say. Um, because it, it, to me, it's like two kinds of hardware would have two different kinds of errors anyway, or sources of error or characteristic error. So ours is just a new kind of hardware that just has a third kind of error. Um, but now when it comes to structured circuits, then I think things maybe become, uh, the differences could become more drastic. It could be that the kind of truncation that MPS does, the kind of noise that we have, which is this throwing out half the singular values at, at these steps, um, is more adversarial maybe to these structured tasks than other kinds of noise, or maybe less adversarial. Um, I don't know. Uh, but that's, that's sort of part of the reason to investigate them, to say, you know, to what extent do these, do these algorithms have to traverse highly entangled states to succeed or not, I think is an interesting question. For, for a lot of reasons, but one being classical simulation. Hi. In order to um, get their 10,000 years estimate, in the Google paper, they use a hybrid quantum Feynman algorithm, a hybrid Schrodinger Feynman algorithm, right? Where they split the entire circuit into two parts. And mm -hmm. along the cut, they perform a Schmidt decomposition of the gates and then only contract some of the Schmidt values. So this sounds really similar to uh, your algorithm where you set the blocking, the grouping to half sites and half of the sites each. So you just have two groups. Um, can you maybe, there are still some differences though. Can you maybe comment on that? Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not such an expert on the details of the algorithm that Google did. Uh, with the, the you're right, it does, it does split the state and and do like an SVD in order to get some advantage of now I'm going to work with this part and this part and you know rewrite some of the parts as a tensor contraction. So I'll be able to um, exploit any kind of low rank that's there. I'll be able to not have to incur the full exponential cost of every step, you know. But I don't know all the details other than that their method still has the task though of tell of drawing um, from the exact state that that they do make clear um, or that that part I know for sure that um, when it delivers bit strings to you they are really coming from the exact random circuit that they set up to simulate whereas ours is not so even though they use some mathematical steps that relate to each other the the basically what the output is is just very different one's the exact thing um, the other one is is this MPS that's already gone quite far from the for that exact state in our case well, but with the hybrid Schrodinger uh, Feynman algorithm, they can also um, only get a final state which only has a certain cross entropy benchmark, a certain mm -hmm. fidelity. Mm -hmm. So they uh, do have to calculate the exact output probabilities too in order to estimate the cross entropy benchmarking. But uh, with the hybrid Schrodinger Feynman algorithm, they can compute only approximate final states. Okay, right. right similar to you, because so then... they don't have to consider all of the Schmidt values along the cut. Mm -hmm. But depending on how many of the Schmidt values along the cut they consider, they can get a target fidelity for their classically simulated state. Mm. So that's why yeah, that's right. very similar somehow. Um, I think this is me maybe venturing though, and that I haven't thought deeply about their algorithm and how it really compares. But I think as a just as a guess or a venture, um, you, you should check me on this. Is that it's sort of similar philosophically on that level. The difference though is that the truncations in the in the TEBD MPS algorithm that we were using. It's really um, looking at the whole mini body state. And then the local truncation translates exactly into a global truncation of the same size, a global approximation of the same size. So it's really saying, you know, how can we adapt the, the mini body basis that we work in on left and right to, to keep, you know, most of the state in some smart way. So it's like a smart targeted truncation. Um, I think the, 
I think what you do when you run that hybrid, you know, Schrodinger Feynman algorithm, it's a little bit more like uh, Monte Carlo, where you know you you sample lar larger probabilities more often and smaller ones less often, but it's not taking advantage of this. Let's identify the best minibody basis for this side of the system and that side of the system, and to do a whole change of basis into this more optimal form where the truncation can be the best because of the SVD. So I think it doesn't have as much of that whole picture. Um, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Or I just Okay, yeah. This is me guys speaking yeah, in ignorance about that algorithm. I agree. Yeah, yeah because you uh, do an optimal decomposition yeah. while they do decomposition of individual gates somewhere within the circuit. Yeah, it's not just a truncation, but it's also like rotating the basis as you go back and forth along the MPS to sort of try to always capture the most of the state you can for a given chi. You know, that's that's part of it too. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an expert in MPS, but uh, just please point me out if I'm wrong. So is it is it correct to understand? So what you're doing here, because MP, 1D MPS to me is like, uh, can be regarded as 1D quantum circuits of look, that mm -hmm. looks like a ladder, right? So you step one, two cubic gates or three cubic gates on top of each other. And then mm -hmm. what you're doing is another way to see uh, what you're doing here. Is it true that you're essentially simulating this layers of layers of brick wall, like quantum random unit cir circuits uh, using this ladder structure circuits instead, or they're different? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's totally right. Yes, exactly. So it's like these ladder circuits that have multiple qubits spanning across each piece of the ladder is exactly mm -hmm. equivalent to MPS. And so it's, it's totally right that we're saying, here's one circuit, let's basically transform it into this other circuit. With the advantage being this other circuit, this MPS kind of circuit, we can efficiently evaluate properties of it. Like if you want to sample from it, if you want to compute its overlap with another one of these ladder circuits, i.e. MPS, you can do that efficiently. You know, it has, it's sort of a special class that very friendly to classical algorithms. Um, and the algorithms for transforming something like a brick wall circuit into these are also very nice and controlled and everything. So it's just like a very nice special class of quantum circuits that are, that just have all these capabilities. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, I just have a, a brief, uh, rather technical question. So uh, thanks for the great talk. I, I was wondering, uh, were you also uh, playing around with variational um, gate application? Because if you have like a, a kind of random state with all kind of correlations on different length scales, then probably you may also um, cut away um, correlations far, um, which are not at the two sides where you apply your gate and you can like gain some more one dimension threshold, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. I think that's that's really the thing I, briefly alluded to, but I didn't say of here, we're just using the humblest technique that there is in the toolbox and already getting these very interesting results, I think, um, in terms of such a simple classical approach, but then it acts like a really nice quantum computer, at least in these 1D circuits. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's acting just like a thing that would be very hard to build in the real world, you know? Um, and so um, indeed, like if you just said, let's use a different algorithm, like where we fit a whole layer of the circuit to the yep. MPS, to fitting methods, this kind of thing. Uh, I'd have to think about it, but my gut tells me, or I think it's right, that that, could, that should um, reduce the amount of truncation because you're taking into account the whole state after the layer holistically rather than just locally. So then you yep. could do a little better, yeah. And you could still get the fidelity because you could still take that MPS afterward, overlap yep. it back with the previous one and still you could still get that. You could still see how much fidelity did you lose at that step. Yeah, I think people should try these these ideas. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I actually would like to ask: uh, Is it possible to combine those tensor network simulation idea with other known methods for like uh, simulating quantum circuits? For example, like uh, yeah, in quantum computing theorist has made a, a lot of progress in. In investigating, yeah, how to simulate uh, Clifford circuits with some kind of yeah small uh, magic state. So, do you think it is possible to combine those ideas with tensor general tensor network simulation techniques? Um, well, so I think certainly it could be combined. I mean, you could. Um, well, let's see. So, 
Yeah, I, I think it. so, but I mean, I'm not totally sure how how some of the steps would go. So I mean, you could certainly imagine like doing a, doing only Clifford operations up to a certain point, taking that state, turning it into an MPS most likely, and then doing a next step that's non-Clifford now using the MPS. I don't totally know how then, if one wanted to go back to doing Clifford, I don't totally know how one would pass back into a, into a representation that remains efficient for that again, but maybe this isn't easy to figure out. I'm just not being able to do it in real time. Um, so I think, yeah, I think basically so, or maybe there's a way to somehow keep parts of the state in different pieces, one that's in that representation, one MPS, but basically it's a good question, but I don't, I don't know totally right away. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So I think this is um, a good time to uh, thank Miles again for this uh, this very inspiring talk. And um, thank you all of you for being here uh, tonight. And uh, let's see each other in two weeks. So uh, Miles, thanks a lot again and uh, see you soon.